What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. Tell podcast episode 185. Dexter Henry Brian Fonseca here. Wow. Hopefully everyone is fine. Yes, we are close to 200. 185. We, we might hit 200. We should by our four year anniversary. Should be right around that mark. Uh, so that should be interesting. 200 episodes. That's, that's a lot of episodes, man. A lot of by episodes. the time we get there, uh, the sponsors will stop bullshitting and uh, cooperate with us a little bit more. Yeah, or maybe not. That's all I'll say. Also, not having fake sponsors reach out to you, it's shady. That, that that was an experience uh, in in itself. But that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother. You see, story. I just walk you into these things. Oh, you yeah, that was that was crazy. <laughs> but we'll, we'll tell the people. Somebody reached out to us about some potential sponsorship, and person called from some shady number. And I knew the website because they sponsor podcasts. Yeah, but so, the whole yeah. setup of everything was shady, and then we basically ghosted them. And they kept being persistent to do it, which made it feel even more still shady. Are. We got an email from them a couple of days ago. Yeah. I don't know if um, you saw that. that yeah, I, oh, I saw that. But- just ignored it. <laughs> I saw it. Just ignored it. Uh, watch watch out for the shady sponsorships. They sound like they're talking to you from uh, some international number through a tin can or something. So it, it felt like that. But, just- but the real ones, AHTT podcast at gmail.com. There you so go. You know. you know how you know how to, you know how to re- you know how to reach us. Uh, very busy or DM time. Us. Yeah, very busy time in the sports world. Very interesting times in the sports world. Uh, a lot to discuss and talk about. But as we're doing this this week, the NBA Finals has kicked off the 2021 NBA Finals with two teams that everybody predicted at the beginning of the year: Suns versus Bucks. <clears throat> Who had that? Who had the Suns going to the finals? We know our producer Greg had the Suns going to the finals. We know that. <laughs> and he was all here for the Suns Hawks. Because if the, if the Suns had played the Hawks, oh, man, Greg would have been insufferable. We might have told you. Told you. Uh, Suns Bucks, nobody picked this, uh, except a few people I know that thought the Suns could go. Uh, Brian, are you more shocked the Suns made it here or the Bucks made it here? I think the answer is probably yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was just like <laughs> either one. I mean, more so, more so, uh, more so Phoenix because Milwaukee. I, I said if Milwaukee got past Miami, which in hindsight is a hilarious thought, uh, should have predicted the uh, bubble would catch up to them because you know we've talked yep. about the lack of rest for certain teams that went far last year, and we saw that play out in the playoffs this year. Milwaukee is uh, less surprising in hindsight, though. I mean. They, it's entirely possible that they would have lost to the. I mean, probable that they would have lost to the Brooklyn Nets had at least James Harden been okay. Uh, never mind him and Kyrie Irving. And then Atlanta, they not barely got by, but like I mean, and they got by without Giannis. In fairness, but Trey Young got hurt, and it was you know that whole situation was dicey. No DeAndre Hunter, uh, no Dante Divincenzo, whatever. Um, I thought that they would have not an easier time with. The Atlanta Hawks, but I thought that they wouldn't have struggled as much as they did. You know, I continued to undermine the Atlanta Hawks at every turn, and they kept shutting me up. Uh, although I have some uh, thoughts that we'll get into another time about how I think they'll fare next season. Um, but that'll be uh, interesting with Phoenix. I mean, look, they had the Lakers in the first round, the other team who went to the finals last year, and it's another situation where maybe you should have seen coming uh, the injuries catching up to the Lakers, but at the same time. Um, one, injuries are, you don't want to predict them. Uh, and two, it's like with the Phoenix Suns, as good as they were this year, we all kind of were like, oh, damn, like they got the Lakers in the first round. Like, I don't really know. Like a few people, like some people had the courage to take them. Uh, and some people, you know, just rolled with LeBron like I did. And why would you not? Because if you roll with with LeBron more often than not over the last 18 years, you probably would have been right. So uh i'm more surprised uh that the suns got this far i'm surprised that they both are and 
I'm at least glad that two that I can say two of the top ten teams in the league got to the finals. You know what I mean? Where it's yeah. not a situation where it's like I heard Howard Beck say this on a podcast, a uh, friend of the show, friend of our show, uh, who will get back up here at some point. Say, like, at least it wasn't, you know, the Pacers <laughs> and the Thunder last year or something like that. Or right. if this year, if it ended up being the Wizards and the Grizzlies, we all would have been like, all right, like, let's relax. But we still got two of the best teams and we still got Giannis, a two time MVP, and we still got uh, Chris Paul, who's been one of the best players in the leagues pretty much since he entered. So, yeah, I think for me, uh, once the Suns got past the Lakers, I saw that this was very real for them and this could happen. And then I started to believe. Um, I think the other good thing is for all the offensive talk that we've talked about, we had two of the top defensive teams, the top two defensive teams in the league this year actually made it despite all their offense. Now, I don't, I'm with Ryan on this. I'm not necessarily sure Milwaukee gets past Brooklyn if they're healthy the way Brooklyn looked in those first two games. I don't think so. I think the Nets probably beat them. Shit, the Nets almost did beat them. Uh, with just Durant, uh, and that makes you if they if they're healthy, which is always one of our big concerns with the Nets, along with defense. Uh, it makes you think how scary they could be next year, depending on what pieces they bring back. But yeah, I would think the answer is probably the Suns because I didn't see them getting out of the first round uh, at all, and you know they did, and once they did, it, they've looked like the most balanced team. But now here in this finals, and we're we're going to game two. By the time you guys hear this, here's before game two. Suns won game one by 13 points. I think that I I was excited about this matchup. I think this is a good matchup, right? This you maybe it wasn't just your sexy matchup. It wasn't LA, Miami last year. It wasn't those markets. It's Phoenix and Milwaukee. Um, and you know, but these teams are good. And you got Chris Paul going for the ring. Three wins away from that. 16 years in the league. Hasn't been to the finals. You got Giannis, two-time MVP. Uh, former deep boy trying to do trying to get this done came back from an injury uh this there's some intriguing stuff here does milwaukee have enough or the sun's really that balanced i don't know about you brian but i like the suns here i i, I picked the suns i'm picking the suns in six i think the suns are just too balanced i think chris paul's too hungry i don't think chris paul's gonna let this team lose getting here the suns players look ready I was even impressed. I said this on the NBA Exchange in the last episode. I was impressed with Devin Booker. He did not shoot the ball well last night, but he still got to the line 10 times in game one. DeAndre Aiden, you got to be impressed with you. These are This is the first time, not just in the finals, people. This is the first time through the playoffs, and we've seen them get more and more confidence, these young guys. Mikael Bridges, none of these dudes played in the playoffs before. And what's also great about this series is nobody playing in the series on either team that's water finals. So I expect this to be highly competitive. I think Milwaukee needs to win game two badly. I expect them to make some adjustments and come back. Uh, but I, I think the Suns in six. I, I don't know who you got, Brian, but who, who, are you taking the Bucks? I mean, I hope it goes seven just because I I, I I agree. Like, there are a lot of people saying that they're not really interested in these finals and, you know, not really happy with it or whatever. And, I, you perfect. know. I'm one of these people who, like, I, you know, I've said, like, I'm not quite enjoying the playoffs as much as I normally do because of all the injuries. But, you know, at least we have two teams that are relatively healthy in the finals. I would say that much, um, which we were probably going to get at some point, just regardless of it was just a matter of who it was. So I think this is a series that can go seven. And I kind of hope it does as a basketball fan. Uh, but I do think uh, Phoenix is kind of a team of destiny. Um, I've said from the beginning, like Chris Paul is probably the guy that I would want to see win a championship the most, see the sort of conversations we have off of that, because I think there's going to be some very interesting ones in terms of uh, where he is amongst all time great point guards and whether or not it moves him up. I think it will for a lot of people, Um, whether or not it should. I mean, that's up for debate and will be Um, what it says about Giannis. I'm not sure, but I mean, look, the Bucks got to this point. Uh, barely, but they got to this point. So, and I, I don't think the Bucks are going to go away quietly either. I think that you know we're going to start to see, uh, especially when they go back to Milwaukee. Like I, I never have big takeaways, grand takeaways from Game One of a right. series. I really try not to because Game One is always where the weird shit happens, and 
the game one is was kind of what I expected. It was close, and then you know Phoenix pulled away. Home court advantage obviously mattered. They did what they were supposed to. Now is when like we're gonna see uh, what Milwaukee sort of has and if they can steal one. Uh, and I think they're very capable of winning one on the road. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, I think we're gonna see. I think a lot of it also has to do with uh, Giannis's health. Giannis didn't know until right before game one if he was gonna play. I thought he looked okay. He did not have his usual explosion, but he looked okay. He looked decent enough. I think as he becomes more comfortable playing with an injury, he should be better. He didn't shoot too badly. I think he was 6 of 11 uh, from the field. So he he was good in terms of defensive rebounding. How much more comfortable he is, especially when they play with small lineups, will be interesting. Um, But I I want it to be competitive. I I want the Suns to have to go on the road, hopefully tied at one, got to get one in Milwaukee too. As well, I, I want them to feel a little bit tested in some of that pressure. They haven't really felt that tested in a while, and I think that'll be nice to see. But yeah, I, I just think overall, man, I don't see Chris Paul letting this team lose. That man looks like he's on a mission. And look, let's pray because we've seen this happen with Chris Paul. The last thing anybody wants to see is Chris Paul get hurt in the finals. For I don't right. want to see anybody get hurt in the finals. I hope we can get through the finals with a clean bill of health. That includes COVID too, folks. We are still in a pandemic. I hope that nobody uh, contracts COVID. Hopefully folks around all these teams are vaccinated and they're safe. Like seriously, I, I think we just want to see a, sa- a safe and healthy finals. Um, and that will be a nice cap to a year. I, I, I understand what you're saying, B, with the playoffs, how you haven't enjoyed it because there's been a lot of injuries. I get that. I haven't enjoyed it. I haven't enjoyed it as much as I as normally you would enjoy if, it, the if people were healthy. Because it's right. just because I'm I'm watching it in fear half the time. Where I'm like, oh, yeah, I get that. You know what I, I get mean? That. And and it's real. It's real coming off the way this condensed season was playing off of last year. All that stuff is legit and real. I think the level of play has still been pretty good. But you there is some disappointment. I have to agree. Like, well, what if AD wasn't injured? And LeBron was healthy, and Kyrie and James Harden were healthy. You know, what could we have seen? We won't know, but I still think the play has been very competitive, and um, I'm not here for the people talking about putting the asterisks on the season. Man, get 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 out of here with that! Like, we, yeah, we're no. not no no need to no need to do that. We don't no. need to do that. And it, and, and Kawhi is another one in the injury. Kawhi, also. another one. Big. And we still don't know what's going on with Kawhi, which is weird as hell. Like the Clippers have still not said anything, which no. is very weird to me. Um, Trey Young obviously getting injured in the last series, and Giannis in the Eastern Conference Finals. So. You know, we'll see. All right, but we both like the Suns. That should make Greg happy. I know Greg also likes the Suns here. Uh, so Suns in six. I would like to see it go seven, though. Seven would be seven. really nice. I'd like a seven-game NBA Finals would be really nice. And you never know what can happen in a game seven. But for now, I'm just going to enjoy the Finals. And hope nobody gets hurt. <laughs> Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind-the-scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Well, in the world of sports, there was some uh, sighing here because it was (laughs) controversial, major news surrounding two ESPN on-air talents. Rachel Nichols and Maria Taylor, if you've been living under a rock, maybe you haven't heard anything about this. So let me give you the cliff notes on this. Cliff notes is Rachel Nichols during last year's NBA bubble. uh, She was in her hotel room as people were doing a lot of stuff remotely, like we are doing this podcast. And the conversation she had uh, apparently was recorded in which she said some comments, a little rant about diversity. Uh, with Rachel Nichols, excuse me, with Maria Taylor. Maria Taylor, who was going to get the opportunity at the time to host uh, NBA Countdown during the finals. Apparently, according to 
Rachel Nichols that had been promised to her. And this happens a lot of times. Promises are made in contracts to uh, people who are on air. And Nichols was unhappy about that. She discussed her frustration of not being chosen for the uh, position with uh, Adam Mendelson, longtime advisor of Lakers star LeBron James. So during the call, Nichols expressed her opinion. Taylor got the assignment because the network was feeling pressure to improve its record on racial issues. Now, folks, you got to remember, this is last summer during the NBA bubble, also during uh, the protests that took in the street by many people in this country, particularly of color, uh, for the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and the countless other black and brown bodies that have been murdered at the hands of the police, and they have gotten away with it for the most part. Uh, this is what Nichols said. I wish Maria Taylor all the success in the world. She covers football. She covers basketball. Uh, this was in the audio excerpt that was published by the Times. If you need to give her more things to do because you're feeling pressure about your crappy long-time record in diversity, which, by the way, I know personally from the female side of it, like, go for it. Just find somewhere else. You're not going to find it from me or taking my thing away. Right? And the problem with this and Brian, I'm going to try to get into this as best as I can. The problem with, and you can, folks, I, I encourage you to read the Times article yourself to get the full context and scope. Everything New York Times, who did excellent reporting on this uh, and took the time to actually do the reporting, which is what you're supposed to do in terms of journalism. Take the time and do the reporting. Um, the problem I'm going to speak on for this that was bothersome to me from what I read from Nichols was the fact that she spoke and you heard from that quote that she said she understands the crappy diversity policies that might go on at ESPN or it could be any company. I've seen this too, working as an on-air journalist. There are a lot of companies with crappy diversity policies. And I've said this before in the show, companies, no matter where you work and what you can do, they can say they care about black people, but they don't. And you should know as a woman, women have their own struggles, no matter what their race and background is in terms of getting opportunities. But what's interesting about Nichols' comments and venting her frustration, as she said, is as soon as she thought an opportunity was being taken away from her, and for those not watching, I'm putting air quotes around that, she then made it about race, or at least alleged that Maria Taylor only got this because she was the Black woman to get this opportunity at the moment. And so where this controversy comes out, folks, is that someone on ESPN recorded the video, showed it to Maria Taylor, also leaked it to a bunch of different outlets. And this is where we get the reporting from the New York Times about it. So there's all this controversy about it. There are plenty of people who are mad at what Rachel Nichols says. And as a black person and somebody who works in sports journalism, I understand that at the same time. NABJ is now calling for a meeting with uh, ESPN. I'll get to my thoughts on that later. Um, and those <clears throat> meetings that come on, come about all the time when stuff like this happens, and I really don't think anything really comes of it. Uh, I think it's kind of bullshit. Brian, I see you smiling. Um, like, like players only meetings? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, it's, 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 it's like, like, I'll get to that. I'm gonna say, I wanna save that point for later. But for me as a black person, as a journalist, was disappointing about Rachel Nichols' comments, and I wanna be clear about this. There have been people saying Rachel Nichols is racist. And there's been people defending Rachel Nichols, saying Rachel Nichols is an ally. Here's the thing. I don't think Rachel Nichols is racist. Right, number one. Like, I, don't, I don't think Rachel Nichols is racist. And I do believe Rachel Nichols could have spent a good amount of her life and time being an ally for black people, particularly in the media industry. But I do think it's interesting. We have to look at when something happened that she didn't felt benefited her. She chose whiteness, right? Like she leaned into the whiteness. It was like this black woman potentially got this because she's black and only fit in this. No way it could be Maria Taylor got it because of her talent or whatever else may be going on. And again, I want to be clear on this too. We speak about having, we spoke many times this podcast, Brian and I, that people covering different leagues, it should be representative of the people that they're covering. So if ESPN wanted and decided to have Maria Taylor because she's a black woman, be the face on NBA Countdown, that's fine. Makes sense to me. We don't really complain about the, I don't see any black people hosting any hockey shows. It makes sense because ain't that much black people playing hockey. I get that. That's okay and that's fine. 
But two, I think the insinuation and what's hurtful to some black people is that this is the only reason that she could have gotten the job that came out in her frustrated comments. And that's bothersome to a lot of people because it's black folks and brown folks he, we, getting opportunities. We always have to hear this. And people are tired of hearing that. And that's why it's upsetting. Maybe that wasn't Rachel Nichols' intent. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But I, I think we can say the, the comments are problematic and how she sort of defaulted to race. And then what's also bothersome that I don't think she left out of the story, Brian, I'll let you speak in one second, is that uh, the man she was speaking to, and I'm sorry, his name is escaping me right now. Uh, his name was Le- LeBron James' advisor. Was Let's it go- Adam Mendelson? Mendelson. Sorry, Mr. Mendelson. Yeah. He made some comments about how things may have gone too far with the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter. And, you know, that was an opportunity if Nichols felt differently to shut him down. And she didn't shut him down because she laughed at that comment. And it was like, one, as a woman, that was disturbing that she laughed at the comment regarding Me Too. And if you are really an ally for black people, there's nothing funny about the Black Lives Movement has gone too far. In fact, I'm, I will say neither of those movements have gone far enough because we still have toxic masculinity and we damn sure still have racism. So I don't consider it a laughing matter at all whatsoever. And that was really disappointing. She had an opportunity to actually truly be an ally there and she dropped the ball. And Rachel Nichols, you know, that's something she has to deal with. But she has to acknowledge her privilege in this to even complain about opportunity. Let's also be clear on something. Rachel Nichols is the daughter-in-law of Diane Sawyer. Can't tell me that didn't help her in some way. I'm not saying it's the only thing. I think Rachel Nichols is a fantastic, as a fine reporter, but you can't tell me that didn't help her at all knowing that. So let's not act like people are just getting opportunities for certain things when you may not have gotten as far as you've gotten in your career. If somebody a didn't like you for the reason, might have liked your mother-in-law, whatever may reason that may be, there's a whole host of reasons that people get hired sometimes or don't get hired sometimes. So. She didn't check her privilege, and I think that's the problem for me here. Oh, there's so many layers to this. I mean, honestly, like you, honestly, somebody can legitimately, I'll throw this idea out there in case somebody wants to do it. Hopefully not, but somebody could legitimately do a seven part podcast series on this entire uh, thing because there are so many layers to this, and you could just pick one and do an episode on it. The thing that I come back to as I keep thinking about this days later is just the culture of ESPN and what I've heard Jamel Hill discuss, what I've heard Dan Lebatar discuss, what I've heard Amin El Hassan discuss, and all three of them actually discuss this together on Lebatar's show, and what I've heard other people carry champion ex ESPNers have lent voice to uh, that culture and <clears throat> how, as Dexter mentioned, they uh ex ESPNers put, of color. I just want to also add that. Brian. Yes. XP, that matters. That That's an important thing. Of yes. Color. yes. Absolutely. That's an important thing. Because the, so this is how the revolution sort of started. The revolution of a lot of people just leaving ESPN and deciding under the Jimmy Pataro era that yeah, uh, we're we're not doing this anymore in that way, right? And uh with Rachel Nichols in protect particular, she felt very territorial about keeping something that she felt like she was entitled for. And while I do understand that part of it, the problem that bugged you, me, and a lot of people was basically <laughs> alluding to her thinking that Maria Taylor is a diversity hire, which you know is not the case. Uh, Maria Taylor is actually very good at her job. And <laughs> the most interesting thing, or not the most interesting, one of the most interesting things that we're not talking enough about is that this is all happening during the NBA Finals in which... Uh, Rachel Nichols is no longer the sideline reporter for Malika Andrews is, which that's an interesting move from ESPN. It's almost as if they were like, oh, let's find the other black woman and put her on camera (laughs) to sort of, you know, ease ourselves away from this because that's just a move that ESPN uh, apparently tends to do. And then on top of that, you have Maria Taylor's contract is expiring during the NBA finals. She has a lot, a lot of leverage right now, not just because Jalen Rose said, uh, what he said on Countdown, where he sort of hinted at Maria. He didn't hint at it. He straight up said Maria Taylor's underpaid. And Maria Taylor, being a professional as she is, just try to move off of it and get into the commercial break or whatever. Um, it was a really funny moment and a really funny segment that rings in an interesting and different way uh, days later. And 
Maria Taylor has so much leverage in the situation now where I feel like, you know, does she want to leave during the NBA finals and potentially like get X amount of money elsewhere, do her own thing? Does she want to stick up ESPN for another, you know, 10 or 30 days or whatever it is and get more money to do it and then leave? Like, that's a fascinating element to this as well. The thing that I keep coming back to, though, is just the culture that ESPN has had and how they're just so ill-equipped to really handle a lot of the things that they're trying to half-heartedly address and one of it is being just the representation that they have not on camera but the people making the decisions which is something we talked about a lot on this podcast is a lot of these companies while they're starting to put more people that look like dexter and i on camera gradually the people who are the producers the people who are uh, actually in control of all this stuff and recruiters and hiring people and really calling the shots at a lot of these places are not people of color and in a lot of cases are not allies. Another element of this is very interesting is Rachel Nichols straight up saying in the clip that a lot of the people that she works for are Trump loving white conservatives, which is why it's been hard for her. And I would imagine others uh, to advance in the company. And Dexter talked about this earlier too, where Rachel Nichols said that she's felt, you know, some of the, uh, imbalance, if you will, from being on the woman's side of things. I will add, though, Maria Taylor, being a black woman, has felt the heat just that much more because that's how these companies sort of operate. Like, at the end of the day, um, you know, there's a lot of different layers here that we can sort of discuss. Um, I also think that just ESPN is just demonstrating to be sort of ill-equipped at this. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> There are some other things that I really can talk about also. That Understood. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to. Understood. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about it more. And I think there's a larger conversation because people who, watch, who listen to watch our podcast have known that Brian and I have spoken a lot about things in the workplace, things in sports media culture. We have spoken with guests here that are within the sports media industry about this, especially surrounding diversity. At that company also? At that company too. But I think the thing is, You know what? I don't want to hijack this because Jamel Hill said this and she knows better than anybody. But she talked about she said uh, on Dan Lebertard show, which Brian mentioned before, she talked about how people will look at the worldwide leader and look and be like, man, yo, they they are really good. They got this diversity thing pretty good. You see black and brown faces. That is true. But what matters is about how you treat people when you're in there. Trust me, people. I know on this, too. You can work for companies that look like they're hiring black and brown people, but the culture's shitty. They're awful, right? Like, we will get more into this very specifically (laughs) on another podcast about this. Trust me, I'm telling you. There's stories. I got stories to tell. Word word of biggie about this. This, I, I know this. I've lived this. I've seen this as somebody who's reported on air in cultures that don't necessarily care care about people in that. And when I think when uh, minorities are seeing this, they're very quick to go away. Brian, you brought up a great point that shouldn't be lost that Rachel Nichols did speak about uh, about the culture and the white men uh, around her being in that uh, conservative or Trump-ish category about that. She spoke on that and how that was a problem. And I don't, I don't doubt anything she was saying on that was inaccurate at all whatsoever. So when you look at things like this, this is something that's bothered me and something I want to speak about, specifically addressing black people and how black people feel about this as a black man. Speaking of this and a black man who's worked in, in journalism, sports journalism, when you look at everything that's happened with this and what should be part of the story, too, which Brian's saying is very layered, and I do agree, is that you had a black woman who became the fall person, who was one of the video producers, somebody that apparently showed Maria Taylor this which I would have done if I was in a position. I want to make that very clear. I would have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know what? Black people, I think people of all minorities would have felt like they had to do it because we know how things are in this culture when people are saying stuff about us and talking about us. So don't think that we get the opportunities. So we're going to look out for our homies and be like, yo, you see what this person's saying? I would have done the same thing. Now you can get into the judgment of whether morally it's right or wrong, evasion of privacy. And I think people who are jumping to that conclusion are giving a pass for what's being said and I don't I'm not with that. However, right? It's about well the company hasn't taken any action we've seen thus far against Rachel Nichols. Now there's an argument that can be made she was removed from sideline reporting for the finals and that was her quote unquote punishment. 
okay. That, but that, but but you know what though? That's yeah. not really that's not really anything. Like okay, so they they like for example, here's how they've done it so far, right? They put Malika Andrews in. It's like oh, let's get the other black girl. You know, let's try to fix this or whatever. Yeah. And that's not really fixing it, as we said, because all these problems are systemic, which is what we've been talking about uh, really as a country for the last however long. Um, and then they do the jump. She kind of yes, talks I'm, about I'm, it. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Yes, kind of talks about it. And tosses it to, you know, Kendrick Perkins and Richard Jefferson. And it's like, the problem is that really, and look, Rachel Nichols, yes, should address it. But the company shouldn't be putting all of them in that position to be the first thing that we hear coming out of this. Like, we should actually get something before that from a company standpoint, even if it's Jimmy Pataro coming out and saying something, who's like the head of all, all, all the shit going on over there. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think even Rachel Nichols should be put in that position before the company should, because I think the company has to speak for some of the things that she said in that audio that's really damning your company and your culture and all those things that we've already talked about. And then to put Kendrick Perkins and Richard Jefferson in a tough spot, and a lot of people were clowning them uh, you know, because they were basically caping for her and a lot of people had the jokes that they were, you know, Superman trying to hold up the white chick and all this shit. And I think that, look, they're put in a tough spot because they do want to keep their jobs evidently. And it's like, I, like, I, I don't know what I would tell them to say in that situation because I don't think they should have been there to begin with. I agree. There's, there's, there was one option. There were two options, like you said. Well, I think both things could have happened. Company should have came out and said something on it. I agree with you on that completely. Or you let Rachel make that statement. That's it. What they did was they had Rachel make her statement or whatever. And then it was like, oh, you know what? We got two black guys here too. Let's yeah. hear let, let's let's see what they have to say. And it's like, nah, man, and like then, that's not and cool. then they canceled the jump for the next day, like the day after. Right. There like was no jump, which didn't make sense to me. And I'm like, so so clearly leadership doesn't really know like there's no you know plan why? here you know why because they didn't got any people of color to come in there and check them and be like right. yo and that's, you know what that's, that's not really the move the, i think that's, that's the that, problem i agree that's, that's the most important thing in all of this i agree we, we talked about this extensively that's, on sunday we i agree all the shit like as i as i sit and think about this more now i think this is what i keep coming back to is like from the top down at virtually all of these companies many of which uh, not many of which, but plenty of which Dex and I have bas- have worked at, right? It's a lot of the same stuff, and a lot of them don't seem to handle these things well. well. And the real issue is that they have these problems to begin with, because you never hear about this come from certain places. But, right, you, no. but you hear about this routinely, especially the last few years in the post-John Skipper era of ESPN, Jamel Hill, uh, Kerry Champion, uh, Dan Levitard, Amino Hassan, and others have spoken out about this, and others who leave will do so as well, I would imagine. So I, I, I think the problem is what they keep showing is that they don't care to. They think they can just sweep the bad press under the rug and not address what Brian is saying, the systemic cultural issues within the workplace. This is a part, these comments, to even make the comments or what even came out of Rachel Nichols's mouth, whether her intent was there or not, it's all part of the larger problem of systemic racism that trickles down, right? And people feel like they're losing something. So yep. when I even heard this, I wasn't even shocked. Like, I'm never shocked that when white folks feel like they're losing something, that they then say, oh, yo, these black and brown people are possibly taking this from me. I'm never shocked that that's the insinuation. And, the, and, the, insinuation, in and, and the insinuation is that the people of color are less qualified. Qualified, yeah. Never shocked about this. This is par for the course. Not like now, being a minority in America, we know this. But here's what I find interesting in what you said, Brian, about whether they decide to do a punishment or no punishment or if what they tried as a punishment, canceling the jump the day after they had her come on and all that, all that stuff. We know when ESPN wants to come down on employees for certain things, they will. A lot is telling to me, does anybody remember, and I'm trying to make sure I get the time right on this as I'm looking at this. I believe this was le- this was July of last year, almost to the time we're recording this uh, a year ago. Does anybody remember when ESPN suspended Woj? For that uh, profane email he sent to Senator Josh Hawley, who made the comment about how Adam Silver shouldn't have allowed uh, messages of social justice on the jersey. And pretty much Agent Wojnowski was like, fuck you, right? This was his email response to the dude, right? This right wing senator, he was like, nah, I'm not here for that. What did ESPN do? They suspended Woj for two weeks. 
right? Which on this podcast, I killed them for. Killed I was them for. not happy that Wolves got right. suspended for that. Wolves got suspended for two weeks. You could say there are black people, particularly black, specific, not just only black people, but specifically black people that are annoyed about the situation and what Rachel Nichols said and how this has all been handled, blah, blah, blah. All that's happened. No suspension, no action from ESPN. And what this says to me, and I was having this conversation with a few other people who are black about this is ESPN kind of knows they don't have to suspend her because in their eyes, it doesn't matter. And what they're kind of saying is they don't think enough black people who watch ESPN or the jump or whatever are going to stop watching. But you know what they do think? They do think the people on the right that don't necessarily care about people like us for the most part, they'll stop watching. And so they got to appease that because that's a large amount of their viewership. And they have to appease that. That's why Woj got suspended and nothing happens in this case. And my message in this to black and brown folks is like, Yo, you got to wake up when you see stuff like this. Like, then maybe this is the time to take a stance. But I'm only going to speak for my people. I've seen before when things have happened that hasn't gone well. We can look directly at Colin Kaepernick. How many people that look like me said, hey, you know what? I ain't going to watch the NFL no more. How many of y'all did that? Maybe it's the time. And you got to show where your dollars and you put your money where your mouth is. And I think at times when the companies don't take action, they know that we're not going to do that because we haven't been doing that in recent history. All right. We haven't been doing that in recent history and they know that. And that's why you don't see any action. So with that being said, when I see things like National Association of Black Journalists, and I'm a member of the New York chapter, is going to have a meeting. It's like, all right, and demand what? Like what we've done these meetings before when we see this racist stuff happen at different TV stations or people, they're not hiring black folks and no opportunities. What's changing? It's the same thing. That we said last summer, Brian and I said on here, we wasn't excited about people doing their Blackout Tuesday and all these companies <laughs> posting these messages of, you know, unity and all this other stuff. And then they didn't do anything. Or in the case of the company I used to work for, I had to be the one to sit there and say, hey, y'all need to put a message out. And I'll get into more of that. And they didn't want to do that. Clown show. That's, that's what it is. So when are we as minorities, and I'm speak, particularly speaking of black people, but all our minority brothers and sisters in here too are going to be like, yo, this is enough. We're not supporting this anymore. That's when the real change happened. I'm not asking for people to lose their jobs. That's not what Brian and I are talking about. What Brian and I are talking about is like, damn, can y'all show y'all want to do the work to actually be better? And so far, the white folks in this company, whether it's ESPN or whatever companies you may work for, and this does not just apply to sports broadcasting, they have not shown that they are willing to do the work. That's the problem, mm-hmm. right? And they haven't been forced to be shown the one day to do the work because they still getting paid, still getting that bag. Those dollars are still rolling in. Until they stop seeing the dollars rolling in and they're hurting that way, they're going to continue to do this because they have no incentive not to do so. This will blow over. Something else will happen. On to the next thing in the news cycle. And I'm afraid that's what's probably going to happen here. Women's boxing. Puerto Rico. The Olympics start in two weeks. I know Brian's been ready because he's been watching a lot of uh, FIBA Olympic qualifying basketball, keeping yep. me updated on a lot of that stuff going on. Your boy Luka Doncic is <laughs> that dude. Woo, my God. That's a cold That's a cold guy, man. Slovenia has never been to the Olympics before, and they got this dude, and now they're going. And only 12 teams go to the Olympics. All right? Yeah. That's- <laughs> yeah. They, they, they might want to build a statue of him in Slovenia. I don't know uh, how they show their appreciation, but they might want to because he took them to places they haven't been before. Now, 
we got a lot. We're going to talk a bit about the Olympics here because a lot of stuff going on around the Olympics. But first, we should start and note that the Olympics, they're still on, but uh, <laughs> Japan uh, is in a quasi state of emergency right now. Okay. Um, as there's surging COVID 19 cases uh, in Tokyo, they've hit a two month high, but the Olympics accordingly is still uh, going on. And a new state of emergency could lead to a ban even on local fans attending these Olympic Games. The the decision on the fans is expected to come this Friday. That's when local organizers meet with the IOC, International Olympic Committee, and others. Now, the present quasi-state of emergency that they are in right now, and Sunday, Tokyo reported 920 new cases. Last Wednesday, that's up from 714. uh, Excuse me, that was this Wednesday. They reported the 920 new cases, 714 last Wednesday. It's the highest total since 1,010 cases were reported on May 13th. Woo! That's a lot. And, uh, yeah, they're still trying to get this show on the road. They're still trying to do it. They want to decide now if they're not going to have fans. That's crazy. Um, I will be on the record in this and saying that I thought the Olympic Games should go on this year because I thought the athletes should have a year to compete after they were canceled last year. However, I never thought it was a good idea to bring fans in with so many people traveling to Tokyo, coming into Japan and other country from many different places in all these different countries across the world have handled COVID dif- differently. And that's the problem you're arising there. So that's very interesting in how you make it work. Now with the cases going up in Japan and we have the Delta variant out there and all the concerns that are around that, you don't know who's coming and who's vaccinated, who's not. I, we hope that this won't be a mess. You know, we, we don't want it to be. We hope that it's not. But uh, they got to be under a state of emergency. That's not good. Now, I mean, I mean, that's not good. I, 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 I spoke to I can't I spoke to an athlete who is going to the Olympics uh, in a couple of weeks. And I spoke with him for a story I'd worked on a couple of weeks ago. You know, he told me from what he had heard, you know, it was going to be safe. The restrictions were good and how they can move. And they pretty much confined to the Olympic Village. Uh, he told me that. But, you know, I, I'm hoping all the athletes are safe and people can be safe out of there. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with that. But around the Olympics, there's been a lot of talk, a lot of stuff going on. Maybe the most notable is around Shikari Richardson, who if you've been watching, I've been following the U.S. Olympic trials for track and field. I love watching the track and field stuff. Shakari so, Richardson will not be on the U.S. Olympic team. Uh, she is facing a month's suspension after she was drug tested uh, for, and found out she was positive for marijuana, THC in her system. And so initially it was thought it was known that she would not be able to compete in a hundred meter relay, a hundred meter a dash, which is her event. She was a uh, very exciting, a uh, flamboyant runner, really was liking her style and what she could do for the U.S., but we wouldn't get to see her competing that. So there was some hope that she could then be on the 4 by 100 relay team, 4 by, four by, uh, four by 100 relay team, yeah, excuse me. But she is now not on the U.S. Olympic team at all, which is very disappointing. This is one of the bright star, young stars in track for the U.S., and she will not be there. This has prompted a lot of conversation around whether she should have been allowed to compete. Uh, she is just, I hate to say, but a lot of people are putting it to this. It's just marijuana. It's not like she had a performance-enhancing drug. We have many states in this country, in the United States, where marijuana is legal. Also many states where marijuana has been decriminalized. So maybe we need to look at the drug testing that we do around Olympic athletes competing, particularly in terms of marijuana. Brian, I haven't actually spoken to you about this, so I don't know how you feel about this. But, you know, there's going to be some people and, you know, I'm sure there's all the Stephen A stuff, lay off the weed and all that not all that nonsense that you know people just run to on this. But I think the issue is more complex. And I think there was a discussion to be had. Well, hey, if this is le- illegal for recreational use in was it 19 states in this country right now and decriminalized in a, in a lot more states. And that number is growing. Should we still be testing athletes for marijuana? No, fuck no. Like, who who cares? Like, for me, I've already said, like, like, actually, let me not grab that because that's probably a confidential. There was a bunch of, like, pill bottles next to me, though, right? None of them are mine. Mm-hmm. And I'm letting you know that when I'm older, 
I am not going to be one of these people who's going to take all the shit that the hospital prescribes me to heal my medical ailments. I am eating edibles. That's what the fuck I'm going to do. All right. Like <laughs> I, I am ter- I somebody who doesn't smoke or doesn't consume weed and never has uh, outside of a contact high. Never before uh, have I done it. That's the first thing I'm turning to. I've heard Al Harrington and Ricky Williams and like I'm in when I'm 40 something. And if I got some shit going on, if it comes before why you, that, why are you trying to make sound whatever, like 40 something is old? No, nah, I'm just saying like that, you know, you wake up, your knee is aching, like, all right, let me right. pop this edible. I might be I might be straight. You know what I'm saying? I might be a little too relaxed. But Brian's like that eat, Brian's eating of the earth. That's yes, what he's telling he's I am of the turning earth. to that first. I'm probably not gonna smoke it because I'm you know, I'm probably just, you know, eat that shit. Especially if it's like a brownie, if it's in a oh, oh my god, I hear that shit sounds delightful. Um, as it as it pertains to the actual, and I want to say this about like uh, I don't know how you feel about the 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 uh, fans going to the Olympic situation, Dex. Uh, to me, well, not well, not good after the numbers I just read. Well, I'm to me, but I'm saying if you bought a ticket, like I, this is kind of a buyer beware situation for me. Like, right. I, I don't know if I feel that bad for you <laughs> if you're not going to get to go. I hope you get your money back. I hope you get refunded, obviously. But look, man, this ain't an Olympics that I would have wanted to go to at all as a fan, as media, whatever the case may be. As a competitor, that's a different story. Uh, and, you know, hopefully all the competitors are OK, because that's sort of the main thing here. We're sending a lot of motherfucking athletes from a lot of motherfucking countries out there. So right. there's going to be a lot of things to account for now. In terms of the Shikari Richardson thing, like, no, I don't think athletes should be tested for weed necessarily. I mean, if we really want to know if it's in their system, I guess that's okay. Uh, because, I mean, you don't want people, like, you know, doing too much of anything necessarily. So maybe you want to, like, keep it moderate or some shit. I don't know. But I don't think that, like, especially in track, coming from a former high school MVP uh, at track and field. All right, I do want to point that out there. The trophy is right over there. I can get it if you don't believe me. I will say this. Weed, plenty of people did it that I was running against or long jumping against. I don't think it helped or hurt them. Uh, if anything, it was probably more impressive that they were able to perform uh, after the fact. <laughs> uh, so to me, it's like, it's whatever. I think, uh, you know, people are trying to give a Shikari Richardson issues for things beyond that now because a lot of people are, you know, uh, starting to get annoyed with some of her tweets, and that's another discussion for another day, one that I will not participate in today uh, because I need to get caught up on all that anyway. And I kind of don't care how to rush to cancel people either. Uh, I'm over that fucking thing, uh, part of Twitter. But in terms of the weed thing, no. I think, um, you know, if you want to eat it, if you want to smoke it, if you want to do whatever, uh, I think you should be fine and be able to compete in the Olympics. I will say this, correct me if I'm wrong, Dexter, but the testing for marijuana, I believe that's an Olympic rule, not a United States rule. That's um, correct. So I, I think I do think people are misunderstanding that part of it. Uh, I am not the person that cops for America in many things, but I will say that this is not like a United States sort of mandated thing because like people are comparing uh, because we do the comparison thing of this and that and third. And like, I think the Olympics are the people that are wilding here. So you should direct your anger towards them. But again, I'm not the person who cops for America because my favorite moment in Olympic sports history is when Carlos oh, Arroyo yeah. and Puerto Rico beat team USA in 2004. So, and, and, and Hey, nothing wrong, nothing wrong with some love uh, for some national heritage and pride. Not, nothing wrong with that. Now, Speaking of the Olympics, another Olympic sport that's uh, hugely wildly popular for the summer games is swimming. Uh, swimming. Speaking of weed, oh, how Michael Phelps? <laughs> he ain't Sw- the only one. He can't right. be the only one. Yeah, you know I mean, I mean? and and to be fair, the difference is with Phelps was this was after he had competed, um, and and it's a little bit different before they competed. So I understand the, the, yeah. the difference there. But I just don't think – I think as we're looking to decriminalize and legalize, I, the, my last bow I'll put on that is, yeah, I think we should look at how we're testing people for that. And I've always thought, like, you know, we haven't had enough data on how that could actually affect people's performance in any workplace, even particularly athletics. And, you know, I don't know why, why don't people tell, test more for alcohol abuse because that, 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 that actually, does more damage yeah. to people's lives. And there's facts on that that does way more damage to people's lives than weed ever has. Um, so I forgot the exact numbers of people who have been I mean, in alcohol-related look, deaths 
uh, every year, but it's pretty damn high. Like it's somewhere around a hundred thousand in this country. So yeah, J- Jimmy it's- Uso, Jimmy Uso from uh, the Uso Twins in uh, WWE wrestler just got his third DUI, I think, uh, this week. Uh, yeah. Second in two years, you know what I mean? Like that's some serious shit. Like I don't, I don't hear a lot of stories about people doing so much weed that they wind up in the right. hospital or, right. or or have to go to the precinct because they did a they did a they did a nasty or whatever the case may be. Right. So. I think most people just most people uh, smoking a joint or whatever recreationally they're just trying to chill out, man. Like that's generally what it is. So yeah, I mean, hopefully this is a conversation that people don't forget and and, and can move on. But now. Well, I talked about swimming. Swimming found themselves in hot water last week. Um, the International Swimming uh, Foundation made a decision to bar a swimming cap that was designed specifically for natural black hair from being used in competition. The makers of the Soul Cap, dope name, shout out to Soul Cap, was a, a product tailor made so that uh, swimmers with voluminous, beautiful black hair like myself uh, can protect their hair while in the water. And look, as a black person who actually used to swim competitively when he was younger, when your hair is thick or full, the way my hair is right now, the caps are not designed for us. They're designed for straighter hair. They're designed for white folks to be more blunt about it. And so the company Soul Cap, they put on Instagram last week that the sports governing body denied their application for certification, um, which pretty much, to sum it up, assumed that the cap would not be used when the Olympic Games begin in two weeks. Like we said, this drew a lot of backlash from a lot of people. And th- they didn't even have to have one of those meetings. That didn't even have to happen. But now FINA, International Swimming Federation, uh, which is what they're known as, they released a statement saying that they are going to review the situation and possibly reverse their decision. Now, if I can talk to some people from FINA, pretty much have one question what did you know now that you didn't know then when you made the decision right like you just got this heat from a bunch of black people who were mad about this and it is absolutely discriminatory i'm not also this is also you could file this away in the cabinet of i'm not surprised these white folks are tripping i wasn't at all whatsoever either like here are black folks people black swimmers and black swimmers competing have spoken out about this, how they caps have not necessarily worked for them or their hair and their texture. And here's a company that makes this. It gives these athletes no advantage <laughs> in the pool at all whatsoever. And they're like, nah, we want to shut this down. Like, FINA doesn't just get to review it and pass on. Like, we need answers to this. We need to know why are you doing this? What made you come to your senses and realize that this was racist? It is. And you didn't need to do this anymore. Like, we want to know, because I feel like when they review and reverse these decisions, Brian, we just move on. It's like, oh, yeah, they gave us what they want. It's like, nah, where's the accountability for this? Like, if somebody has a cap that works better for their hairstyle, why would you not want to let them use it? It doesn't make any sense to me. But again, not surprised. Yeah. I will, what I will add to this that if you want to wear a fucking headband, a waterproof do-rag, uh what like who gives a shit you know what i mean like just you should just swim and they should just allow you to swim like whatever the case may be so i i think that the rules are kind of like the ncaa and we talked about them some of these rules that we're still abiding by and some of these um sanctioned events are too old school uh now the college players are starting to get paid uh, because of the NIL rule, but they're still not getting paid from the actual colleges that they're making the money for. And now you have this situation where, I mean, we can <laughs> we can read between the lines of what's going on here and why they felt the need to reevaluate this is because, uh, what a shock, they overlooked that, hey, a lot of black people, uh, you know, aren't going to be for this, but that's something that they evidently yeah. didn't care for I, early I, on. I'm glad you said that, overlooked, because that's what they did. They They thought, like... People only make these moves if two for two reasons. One, as Brian brought up before, this is just like the thing we talk about ESPN and other companies. There's nobody in FINA that was black or brown to check them. One. Or two, they just didn't think that any of the black or brown people would come for them on this. That is, it's both of those things. Yep. FINA did release a statement. They said, FINA appreciates the efforts of Soul Cap and other suppliers to ensure everyone has a chance to enjoy the water. Excuse me, let's stop there. 
Let's stop there. Well, we're talking about the Olympics or fucking splish splash. Like, what the fuck Hold is on. that last sentence? You said the, comp- <laughs> the, the organization appreciates the efforts of Soul Cap and other suppliers to ensure everyone has a chance to enjoy the water. Except you didn't because you banned this. Like, you didn't do it. So you did not appreciate the efforts. Like, Listen. now in hindsight, you do. And they said they expect to make the consideration of Soul Cap Similar products, part of the wider initiatives, I'd like to know more about those initiatives, aimed at ensuring there are no barriers, which you caused, to participation in swimming, which is both a sport and a vital life skill. Man, yo, I, I just thought about somebody we absolutely need to get as a guest on here before the Olympics to talk about this. Absolutely has to happen, Brian. We got to make this happen. I got somebody who can actually talk about this. This would be great. We, we, we got to make this remember happen. and tell me off here. The last I thing will I will say on this. I'll tell you off here. We got to we got to do some wrap up. I will say that um, it, it, it just annoys me when people are just so it's annoying and telling when people are just so anti natural hair. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This code for <laughs> other things. Anti black. Yeah. Uh, so. I just think that, look, just let people swim in whatever the fuck they want. Like, if somebody wanted to wear a fucking ski mask in the pool, I wouldn't give a shit. (laughs) Uh, You know what I mean? Like, whatever. Who cares? I don't know if that, that that actually might be cheating, now that I think about it, depending on how the ski mask is cut up. But yeah, just, you know, just let people swim. The waterproof do rag idea, though, I think I kind of like that one. I, will, I want somebody to. Do that. I, I could see, you, I could see you supporting. The last thing I will, <laughs> I will say on this is Alice Deering, who is going to be the first ever black woman, or slated to be the first ever black woman to represent Great Britain in swimming at the Olympics this year. She's actually an ambassador for Soul Cap, according to the mm. brand's Instagram, and she said, "quote I don't want little black boys and little black girls to look at elite swimming and think it's not open to them because Word. that is completely the wrong idea." It is open to them. I'm really hopeful that it is being under review and that some agreement will come about. Let's hope so. Yeah. I hope that FINA has now seen the error of their ways. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mind. This week, we are going to talk about another album that turned 25 years old. We talked about Reasonable Doubt on a previous episode with our guy Sky Zoo. Yeah. But Another album that turned 25 just a week later after Reasonable Doubt was released is It Was Written, second album, sophomore album from the legend Nas. Uh, An album that it's very interesting because I feel like when we have this discussion that we're going to have around It Was Written, uh, you know, Brian and I, again, like because of our age gap, they're the way we receive things. Some of these things I'm talking about, I received it more in the time, but I was also young in the time. I was a starting uh, I was in my senior year of middle school at this time. This album being dropped, same as Reasonable Doubt, so it's a little bit different. Brian kind of went back to this after, but what I do remember at the time, Brian, about this album being dropped is a lot of people. I remember talking to my cousin about this so much because he's the one that got me into Nas and Nomadic. This was such a different sound from Nomadic, right? This this was this was Nas's first like big commercial success off of Illmatic. You know, this was a commercial album with the Dre production and you know, it, it just the, the more lush sounding production, if you will say. So it's a very different sound. It's also Nas embracing more of the uh mafioso rap, shall you say, than you did not really hear on Illmatic. So for some people, this is very jarring, and I think very it's a very polarizing album in comparing the two, Ill, Illmatic and It Was Written, but this is still something that's regarded by many people, many Nas fans, as one of their favorite albums. There's even an argument out there, even though I think these people are wrong, that It Was Written is better than Illmatic. I absolutely do not think that it is not. I think that it's not better than Illmatic uh, in any way. I do not think it's the masterpiece that Illmatic is. I think those people are tripping. But I recently listened to this album, uh, because I hadn't sat with it in in a while, and I went through it, and I think it's a very, I think it's a very good Nas album. I do not think it's a classic. I think it's a very good Nas album. Um, a lot of people feel differently. Brian's got his rankings. I know that we'll we'll look through, but I do think it's an album that is absolutely was good, good to revisit and listen to. I think on this album, Nas, you see. Maybe not the introspection lyrically that you saw on Illmatic, but Nas is still lyrically sharp. 
He's showing you a variety of styles um, and aggression. Obviously, one of the biggest hits of Nas's career is on this album, If I Rule the World with, with Laura Hill. And for anybody who does not know, that song, when it dropped, it was everywhere that summer. Everybody in New York was playing it in their, in their car. Uh, just a huge record. Uh, but Brian, enough of me. It's an album I like. It's not one, It's not a Nas album I feel like I go back and listen to thoroughly enough. It is not a straight play for me. There are skips on this album for me. Um, and there's actually a song I think Nas has arguably one of the worst hooks uh, ever on a Nas song. And that is... <laughs> Do you know, do you, are you laughing because you know what song it is? Nas is coming. It's off. That's awful. <laughs> awful. Just awful. Sorry, Nas, I love you, but uh, Nas is coming, which I actually like the production on that. Dre I love that track. beat. That's the thing. Like, I, I love kinda, that I kind of almost don't care. But you know I, hate, I hate that hook. Can you, can, you, can, you re, can you go through the track list one by one? Uh, sure. Let's do can, that now. We we can do this. Well, let's I'll tell all... you. I'll tell you where I had. Go ahead. Okay. So the album starts off. People who've never listened to uh, it was written. The album is a really, um, really good tr- uh, intro track, uh, which Nas is sort of taken back to being uh, a slave working in the fields, um, looking to get out. Uh, which then transitions to a really dope song and one of the better songs to kick off an album. Not an intro in the message, uh, which is really good. Uh, and then goes into uh, one of the, I believe this was the first single off the album, if I'm not mistaken. Street Dreams uh, was the first single off the album. Uh, and, and I think this song, very um, different sounding for Nas at that time. The video was also huge. Uh, you know, took a lot of scenes from Casino, the movie. Uh, next on this is I Gave You Power, I think an iconic Nas song produced by DJ Premier in which uh, Nas uh, raps, it's personification rap, raps as being a gun, uh, very similar to Emily Dickinson's poem, My Life as a Loaded Gun, which I think Nas probably got some inspiration for. Uh, fifth track on here, Watch Them. Uh, that also, that's, a, that's also a Dre beat on there, on this album, so some Dre production. This is huge at the time because Dre had not worked with any East Coast artists. That's something that should be mentioned that people might miss at the time. Dr. Dre hadn't worked with any East Coast artists. Nas was sort of the first East Coast artist he worked with. Uh, Six, Taken in Blood. Seven, Nas is Coming. We spoke about that. Uh, Really like that beat, just that hook. Eight, uh, the posse cut on this classic affirmative action with a, a stellar, I don't know how many bar verse from Foxy Brown. I think it's at least 32. I was gonna um, say I think I think it's thirty six or something like that. I counted this a long time ago, but yeah, let's go through the rest quickly. Uh, nine to set up. Uh, Ten black girl lost. One of my favorite Nas songs. Eleven suspect. Twelve shootouts. Thirteen live and rap. Fourteen if I rule the world. Obviously talked about that. Big 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 record. Arguably yeah. one of Nas's big biggest records. Um, so that's the track. It's fourteen track album. Uh, you know, pretty tight, just under an hour at 58 minutes and 29 seconds. Uh, so not not a, a horribly long listen. Um, what are your thoughts on this track list? Is there anything you would take away? Anything you would have added? Um, yeah, your thoughts, Brian. I, I wish Silent Murder was on it, on the official good one. version. It's a good one. Silent Murder. What, would would, he, would, he would you have recently... taken anything out? How many skips do you have on this album? Because I think we, t- we talked about... Th- you four? What? No, no, no. I, I was saying oh. four me. Four me. <laughs> I was going to say I was four. Saying four. No, it's not four. I have, I can, I have like one. Two. I have two. Yeah. I want to see if we have the same same ones. Well, you know what one is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I Look, I'm not skipping Nas is coming because that beat is fire. See, but, and I, I, I'll probably actually say the more I think about it, I could leave that song because I do like the beat. Is your other one Watch Them with Foxy Brown? No, that, that doesn't bother me. I don't okay. love that hook with Foxy, but yeah. that song's fine. That's a skip for you? No, I was I was guessing. Yeah, I, no. I, I mind that song. It's not one I of my I think favorites. I would get, if I had to take, if I was going to like, if I was going to leave Nods coming because I like the beat, I can get rid of the setup and shootouts. They could, that could go for me. Not crazy. Shootouts over suspects. That's interesting. 
Yeah, I like suspect actually. Sus- suspect might be my other one, but it's for, regardless. Like, okay, so to me, in terms of the lore, to me, we're talking about the best discography in hip hop. And some people would say, you know, Jay and Kanye. I don't know if Kanye is necessarily, you know, hip hop with his last <laughs> several albums. Oh, that's a different discussion. But so I think that this album, while I don't think it's for me, I have it sixth in Nas's discography, but I still think there are a lot of rappers who some people will say are all time greats that don't have an album better than this one, which is to say a lot. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. It sounds crazy when you say it's six, but then as I go through the list, because I thought it would be higher and I always think it's going to be higher, and then no, I, I what do you, like, what do you have over it? Let me hear in this order. One through uh, five would be Illmatic. Uh huh. Duh. And uh, I don't think like you could even make the case it was written as better than Illmatic. Like I don't even think that's a, that's a discussion. You know what I mean? And I think it was written as really good, but Illmatic is legitimately like perfect in terms of hip hop albums. Um, Life is good. Stillmatic, and Godson, and the Lost Tapes was the was the fifth one. Oh, so. I agree. With, I I agree with all that. So, um, like, you know what I mean? And I, like, agree, I agree with all that. I think all those albums. I think all those albums are better. I agree. Life, Life is good to me. Is Nas's is Nas's is number two project and the most underrated in his catalog. Some people like you have the Lost Tapes up there or Stillmatic, I which I don't mind that. You know what I mean? I totally get that. For me, Life is good. Well, maybe I because would... maybe because like that album, like it, it came out as I was leaving high school and entering college. So that was sort of seminal for me. It was around that time where Section 80 hit for me. And I told you Section 80 will always be my favorite Kendrick project because of how I sort of experienced it in real time. Life is Good was the same thing for me. Um, but yeah, Illmatic 1, Life is Good 2, Stillmatic 3, Godson 4. And it was written five, uh, uh, excuse me, Lost Tapes after that. And then it was written. Uh, all great albums. Um, and I think that's the top half of his catalog. Uh, not including uh, Distant Relatives, which I could make a case could be above this too, but that's really to speak to not like how great or not great like it was written was. I think it's a great album. I just think that Nas also has like other works that are even better. Because when you're talking about on a rating scale, I'm still putting It Was Written at like an 8 or 8.5 out of 10. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> you I know just, what I mean? I, like I, all I the think... other albums though, like Illmatic is a 10 and the other albums that I mentioned, Life is Good, Stillmatic, Got Some Lost Tapes are like between nine and a half, nine, maybe eight and a half the lowest. I think my other thing where it was written is I think the first half of the album is better than the second half of the album. Like some of the better songs are in the first half of the album. There's some really good right. ones at the end. Black Girl Lost and obviously If I Rule the World, great song to close the album too. But I just think there are other Nas albums I go to where I think there's songs that mean more to me, or I think he actually has better songs on them that that we've talked about, or just flow better. Again, this is not a knock when it was written. It's it's obviously it's a hugely influential album, especially for the time, the shift in that sound in '96 to where hip hop was changing. You know, we talk about Reasonable Doubt, that was very jazz heavy. Uh, this this is a lot more more modern production for that time. You know, you, you were getting away from those grimy, dusty, dirty drums on the early part of the 90s in New York. I mean, you see these in albums at these times, whether it's It Was Written, whether it's Fuji's dropping later that summer, whether it's Big with Life After Death the following year. You, you're starting to see this 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 more, uh, I would say, like I said, they're not really lush. Lush might be the wrong word, but it's it's a more fleshed out sound, more instrumentation and sampling being Polished. added in. More polished, yeah, you yeah. could say. Hip-hop was starting to turn into more of a polished sound than more of that gritty, grimy sound, which I still enjoy. You can enjoy both of them, but you can see where it was changing. And then also yeah. the, the sort of beginning of this the mafioso era, which was around a lot of hip-hop from Big and Nas and also Jay, um, so that so, sort of rapping about their style and their life. And so you were starting to see that um, as well, too. So there's no doubt this album is absolutely influential also yeah. like that Nas one thing I should be noted about this album Nas continues the the sort of album cover theme that you see of his first album of his face superimposed uh in in the background so it was different from uh Illmatic where he had his face as a kid and now it was his face in his current state and then he also continued that I guess on I am with the <laughs> with the Pharaoh uh theme going on there but like no nah, man and, no- and and he did it on Nostradamus also which look oh i forgot about that that, that but that cover is hard it's just you know it's just not 
it's not it's not exactly uh, an album that's high up there in the rankings. I also want to point this out in terms of uh, yes, like w- a couple of things about it was written. Now we've talked about uh, King's Disease uh, being uh, album of the year last year, and I have that right below it was written I in terms of fair. my Nas album rankings in a tie with I Am because you get there in different ways. I feel like they're both as good as one another, but you get there in very different ways. The thing with I Am, which actually followed up, it was written, was that of all the Nas albums, save for obviously Illmatic, you mm-hmm. could argue, and probably Stillmatic, uh, you could argue that I Am has the highest highs because I think that you could argue there are four top 25 Nas songs on that album. The problem is you also have like uh, Dr. Knockboot, Kissing... You know what I'm saying? Like you have four skips on that album for me, but you four also top have- twenty five Nas songs on I Am. Yes, okay. I, you could Na- argue that. So Nas, Nas is, is like Undying yes. Love. Nas is like Undying Love. Um, you know the other one. I don't know if you'll get the fourth one because the fourth one is probably more of my uh, preference or whatever. One day I will make the top twenty five Nas songs list because I keep saying it. And this is the thing with King's Disease in comparison. We will, Disease, is we will is we will survive one of those. We will survive as one of them, and the Hate Me Now will be the other one. Hey, it's funny. Hate Me Now is such a big record. And I remember. I don't know if I put it there, but I'm saying off the top of my head, like yeah, I would that's argue. Fine. That's fine. That's, those I think that's four, fair. That's those fine. Four, Nas is like is absolutely. That's a top ten, probably Nas song, right? Might be top five. Might yeah. be. Undying Love could be in the top ten, Great fifteen, song. whatever. Great song. One, right? one, one, one of the best songs to close a hip hop album. We Fantastic. will survive. I loved it. I thought. I thought we will survive should have actually come right before Undying Love on a track list. Um, I think that would have uh, been great and made a lot of sense. But like, yeah, and then, you know, Hate Me Now is such a big fucking record, and it was a record that uh, was polarizing at the time, and still for a lot of a lot of people, it's still a big record. You still hear it in arenas, people still oh, use yeah. it for video packages oh, yeah. and things like that. Like, it's it's a, it's a it's so, but the lows, I said, you, he also has a couple of his worst songs on there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, but I think that, and with King's Disease in comparison, I think that it's more just consistent straight through. Right. I don't think there's super high highs. I don't think there's really low lows. I think it's consistent the way through. So I agree with that. It's very good in its own regard. I just don't think I'm putting, I'm probably not putting anything in Nas's top 25, but that's a list that we actually got to compile uh, at some point. We got to do, do that at some point. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. We'll have our top 25 lists and then our honorable mentions. I don't disagree with anything you said. I do, I do have it at the same place as you. We might get to different places in terms of that six, but I think it's six. But again, this, this is a very, this is an album that, you know, deserves his flowers as we did with reasonable doubt. Um, it's, it's like I said, for the time it was in, for what it meant in hip hop at the time. Um, and how did, you know, there's a lot of Nas fans that I think this was some, some, for, for some people, this was an introduction to Nas um, because yeah. it was one of more of the commercial level. So people missed out on Illmatic the same way volume one or volume two is a lot of people's introduction to Jay. Um, so people missed out. So this was their introduction to Nas. And maybe they went back and listened to Illmatic. So yeah, it's interesting, but, Salute, uh, 25 years it was written makes me feel old because <laughs> I remember getting the CD. Um, so, yeah, all this stuff makes me feel old that all these albums we love are getting up there in age in terms of their anniversaries. But that is it for this episode 185 of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. Please continue to hit that subscribe button if whatever podcast platform you listen to. Uh, Subscribe to the Backpack Broadcasting channel on YouTube for sure as well. And follow the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast on Twitter and Instagram. He's Brian Fonseca. I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace. And by Hidalgo Heights. Hidalgo Heights in stores now. (laughs) 